This is the Do Better Podcast with Dr. Megan Miller and Joe Smith, launching you into the future of behavior analysis. Welcome to the Do Better Podcast. In today's episode, we are discussing practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment with Celia Hyman. This is Megan. And this is Joe. This is where we blast off to the final frontier in search of improving ourselves in the field of behavior analysis. Thank you for spending time with us. Now let us begin. How is everyone doing? I, I, I just got to ask that question right away. How is everyone doing right now? <laughs> I am good. Happy to be recording another episode. That's one benefit of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> had more time to record things. That's true. We have been, ha- we have been recording like nonstop this month, um, which is so much fun because I get to spend so much time with you, Megan. And also our guests, we have a couple of guests in the pest, uh, pipeline right now that I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing with everyone. So stay tuned. Speaking of guests, Celia, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. Everyone is healthy on my end. And I'm certainly looking at all the silver linings, you know, with all this, spending more time with families and having my teenage boys here, um, spending more time with the fur baby. So yeah, I'm taking advantage of it a little bit. Wonderful. Well, so today we're talking about practical fun- functional assessment and skills-based treatment. Um, both Celia and I have been following Hanley's work for many years, and I think would be considered early adopters of ISCA practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment. Anyone who's listened to the podcast or webinars that I've done around challenging behavior has heard me uh, sing the praises of the work that Dr. Hanley is doing, and I am forever grateful that his lab and now company, FTF Consulting, are disseminating safer and more humane ways of interacting with clients and showing everyone the importance of developing relationships with our clients and provi- providing a true model of how to do better in a part of our field that historically has not provided much consideration for the qualitative experience that occurs during intervention. As long in the past, as long as the intervention ultimately resulted in reduced challenging behavior, that seemed to be the big picture that that people were focusing on as opposed to what the learners were experiencing during those interventions. Some of you may not know that from the beginning of Dr. Hanley presenting on this process, way back in, well, he originally started presenting the formalized process in 2014, but 2012 is when I started to see him presenting little tidbits and starting to go down the road. Um, but I, I, I think my first conversation with him or attempted one was around 2012, 2013. Um, so I would engage in conversations with him at conferences about the work I was doing as a practitioner and take every opportunity that I could to pick his brain frequently about why or how certain aspects of the intervention were being done the way they were. Uh, For example, there was a point in the research where assent was gained prior to going into the treatment room, but upon being asked during a presentation I was watching in Kentucky, what would happen if the learner refused to follow a demand during the intervention, the protocol at that time, several years ago, was to still use escape extinction. Of course, I quickly approached Greg to ask him about that discrepancy and discuss how, as a practitioner, I don't use traditional escape extinction. And then I was pleased to learn a few months later that they had changed their protocols. Now, I'm not saying I was responsible for that. I'm sure they were already going down that road considering that they were looking for assent before even starting in on the intervention. Um, But I just wanted to lay that out as an example before we get started today because I'm constantly looking at how we can do better in our field. And some of the discussion today will revolve around continued improvements relating to PFA and SBT that I have been thinking about. I reached out to Celia to express some of my thoughts because of some posts around ABAI and the presentations that occurred there. And I greatly respect the work she's been doing in this area and the insight she has on this and many other topics. So this was the longest introduction ever, but Celia, thank you for joining us today. Uh, now that I've sort of explained why we're talking about this and, uh, and why we're doing this little interview today, would you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself, you know, as personal or professional as you would like to be. No, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Miller and Jill for inviting me to your podcast. 
Um, and like many of your listeners, um, I got to know you, Megan, through multiple social media groups um, that we're both in, as well as having attended so many of your trainings in the past years. Um, and then, of course, more recently, you and I, Megan, uh, we've had you know, the opportunity to work on a case together. So thank you both um, from the bottom of my heart, um, just helping us do better. Uh, we really appreciate both of you. So a little um, information about myself. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but prior to this career um, as a behavior analyst, um, I worked in finance for many years ago. So I am probably much more older than the both of you put together. Um, <laughs> but working with young people, you know, really has helped me uh, stay young for sure. So currently I am a BCBA living in the Princeton, New Jersey area. Um, at the moment, I do wear different hats, uh, meaning I work for several organizations. Um, I am an instructor with Rider University here, a traditional uh, brick and mortar university here in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. I also teach at Capella University in their master's ABA program. And then for my clinical work, I work for two uh, service providers. Um, I'm the clinical manager for Above and Beyond Learning Group, providing support uh, for coordinating BCBAs and families here um, in the area, um, home base services primarily. And I also work for Beth Blackberg um, at, Behavior, at her consulting company, providing primarily school consultation. So really just trying to stay in touch and keep connected with all the practitioners that are out there. I didn't think it was possible to meet someone with more jobs than I've had, <laughs> or Joe. <Jill. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you stay very busy, Celia. <laughs> try, try to stay well-rounded and just, you know, make sure I'm connected with opportunities to learn. I think that it's really important to stay connected uh, with academia, but at the same time also to sharpen your skills by practicing um, yeah. and just being in touch with practitioners. I love it. So now that we know a little bit about you, I think, Joe, you were going to ask the next question. Yeah. So one thing that I was wondering about is, uh, Cecilia, what's your background with um, PFA and SBT? Yeah. So the very first exposure of the PFA, I think, like for most people, will be his uh, publication in 2014. Um, and at that time, it was referred back to as the ISCAR. Um, and since then, um, shameless, I have to say, I've been stalking Hanley and his people <laughs> since, <laughs> you, you, you giggle, that's funny, right? Since 2015, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who are, you know, who's stalking them, but um, I've attended in vivo workshops multiple times in New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey as well, in addition to various remote synchronous training, conferences, and on-demand courses. I think the process has really evolved over the years um, based not only on the experiences of his lab, but also lessons learned from practitioners implementing this process. And this is really one of the many reasons why we need to stay abreast and we need to build communities of practitioners practicing this and implementing this and learning from each other. Um, and I have to say, you know, while the specific procedures have evolved over the years, so for example, switching from a time-based performance protocol to a more of a performance-based process or allowing for an open door policy and other types of procedural changes to increase saliency, you know, for the learner to discriminate between reinforcement conditions and EO conditions. I think people need to understand that the tenants and the goals of the PFA remain exactly the same from day one. Um, and Megan and Joe, if you want, if I can just elaborate what these tenants are, because I think that most people um, become rigid in the procedural implementation um, without understanding what is the overarching goals and tenants. So is it okay if I just kind of go through yes. them a little bit? Yes. Okay. So I think that you stay true to the tenants and the framework. One, you know, providing a safe context to demonstrate experimental control. And people always forget, you know, this is an experimental analysis of contingency maintaining problem behaviors. Um, your process should be televisable. We are looking at synthesized contingencies. We are targeting all inappropriate behaviors, including precursor behaviors. We are identifying the motivating operation to teach skills. 
the analysis contacts should align with the teaching contacts and establishing functional control and not function um, categorization. And uh, the most important piece, the most important piece that must be met before we can even begin the analysis is to establish rapport and trust with the learner. And I think that when you have all those tenants upheld and keep, um, it's going to, you know, you're going to have a safe analysis and a safe process. So in 2015, I incorporated just the skills-based treatment portion of the process for several of my learners that I consulted for in school because the staff had inadvertently in the past created um, a behavior chain of problem behaviors to mediate a prompt for more appropriate functional communicative response. So basically um, what staff was doing was they were not teaching the functional communicative response um, in an errorless learning format. So they would only provide differential reinforcement when the problem behaviors were already occurring. They prompt um, the learner, the learner then emit the more appropriate behavior and then get their needs met. So if you just do that, only teaching during times when there's problem behaviors, you could create this inadvertent change. So I've experienced that in my consultations where learners were doing that. In addition, um, I was seeing a lot of ratio strain happening occurring when staff was using like a time-based progressive delay contingency. So basically um, you can have it after a few seconds, then have it after a minute, then five minutes, then 10 minutes. And it was always progressing to a longer and longer time. In addition, they were using um, a progressive ratio. So for every single current target that the learner might be on, by completing that current STO or target, it would only serve as a CMOR or a signal telling them, hey, if I complete this, things are just gonna get worse for me. Things are just gonna worsen for me. So I was seeing all these resurgence of problem behaviors. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. 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 And so because of that, I incorporated the way um, the SPT process was using. They're using a variable progressive um, contingency chain. And it was contingency based. It was not just waiting for reinforcement. It was, um, you know, earning reinforcement contingent on the appropriate responses. And that was so much better um, because of that schedule. We were never, you know, staff was not extinguishing previous or past um, STOs or targets. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. So I started doing that and then I got more training and learned more about it. And that's when I incorporated the full analysis. Um, so I would say that currently, you know, in the past years, I have about maybe more than 15 learners between home base and school consults that have received the SPT protocol and then about 10 where they actually received the full analysis. So from the analysis to school space treatment over the years. That's awesome. Um, I know f for me just personally, like I have been first exposed to um, the PFA, PFA and SPT back in 2018 when I did a training with Dr. Hanley. And I'm still in the process of learning more about the PFA and SPT to implement with my clients. It sounds like you have had a rich history of trainings and experiences with this, Celia. And I think the you, I think the key thing is you got to do it, and you have to do it with people, um, mm -hmm. and you have to get mentorship. So I was able to work with mentors who have been seasoned doctoral level BCBAs, and while they did not understand the PFA, they certainly understand stimulus control. They understood behavior analysis. They understood behavioral principles. And and they understood shaping. So that was the key. And it's an evolution, I think. Um, I think that every time we do this, something else come up, we learn from it. Um, we learn from others' mistakes as well. And it's a growing process. And you know, before we started recording, I talked to you about FOMO, fear of missing out. And that has been a motivator for me to stay abreast with communities implementing this, keep training, keep receiving training from Hanley and his lab, and keep up with the literature because it does evolve and it will evolve even more. It's funny you uh, bring that up. There was a year, I think it was 2015, 
it was either 2014 or 2015, but Hanley was presenting at a ton of conferences and I happened to be going to all of them. I did not, I had registered before they even announced who was presenting. It was just conferences I happened to be going to. And at one point he was like, are you seriously here again? <laughs> like, why do you keep coming to watch me? And I was like, it doesn't like every time you present, whether it's last like a week ago or two months from now, I know you will have new information to share with me. And that's one of the things I've always loved about the work that he does. It's, it's not going to be the same presentation every time because they're constantly evolving too and learning from their own, uh, whether it's mistakes or newfound um, successes and incorporating that into the work that they're doing. So, and I've also been really impressed by how well they've disseminated a lot of that because there's typically a, like, there's just this historical thing in our field where it's like, you can't talk about something until it's been accepted for publication and his group has recognized that practitioners need information faster than that. So you can't just wait for the studies to come out. You need to start disseminating the information now. So, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I, I learn something new every day and I, I can, you know, you were telling us about your history with um, Dr. Hanley, you know, as early back as 2012. And I certainly see, you know, all the valuable lessons that you have been disseminating. So for example, um, you presented at ABBA recently on the critical skills of observing your learner. Um, and if you can observe the learner, then you will be able to make better decision as to what you're gonna do next. So, and, and I see this, I see that staff who have been trained on the PFA, um, they become better observers. And guess what? All these other skill acquisition programs that they have, they are now doing it better. Yep. The, the success of that and the outcome, the collateral benefit is that number one, the learner is engaging in all these additional joint attention without having a program called Look At Me, which I hate that program, by the way. <laughs> um, so they're having this collateral benefit, but skills are, but the, the staff is also having these wonderful collateral benefits too. They're able to be more successful implementing all these other skill acquisition programs because now they're much more of a successful uh, pairer. In other words, they're much more successful at establishing rapport and they're much better at observing the learner um, and doing a lot more within session shaping, which was lacking prior um, to being exposed to the PFA. That, I love that recognition of the collateral benefits. That's really important too. Before we move on to the next question, Celia, was there anything else you wanted to tell us with the background with PFA? any skills that the practitioners need to have that you've seen or anything else about the process that you wanna share? Yeah, I think the two critical skills that you must bring to the table before um, you know, really doing this is number one, the effectiveness of you as a practitioner to pair with the learner. You know, I, I, I tell my staff that if the learner does not want to even play with you, what makes you think they want to work for you? Um, and, you know, if you don't have rapport with the learner, if there's no happy, relaxed, engaged coming from the learner, then you cannot even start the analysis. Forget about teaching. The second thing is shaping. You know, even if you attended like 50 trainings, if you're not a person who has the skill to shape, you're not going to be successful. And, and I think that, again, having the skill sets of a shaper to be able to shape behaviors to be able to establish rapport with the learner and understanding the philosophical underpinnings and the framework and the tenets of a PFA, you can be comfortable going outside of that rigid implementation of task analysis of a program record. Does that make sense? So you don't necessarily have to always teach, you know, or always have to say the folk, you know, the functional communicative response of that learner has to be my way. Not at all. You know, um, I'll give you an example. I would, this is um, an analysis we did at the home and we tested to make sure that um, the learner has a strong echoic repertoire and he did. But you can see the affect on his face when there was a vocal prompt given to him of my way. And what we found out was that in the past, my way typographically sounded too close to my turn. And any time someone would say my turn, that service CMOR, meaning I got to give up my stuff. Um, and so even before we were able to approach him, 
and to take away his reinforcer, you can see these precursor behaviors already. So we did not teach him my way. We taught, you know, let's just say the, the client's name was Tony. We, we, we taught him Tony's way and that worked. So if I stay rigid with the procedure, I will be teaching my way and guess what? Evoking all kinds of problem behaviors. Does yeah. that make sense? I love that example. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you and for then, sharing. Yeah. And I think that's also really critical to um, have that rapport with your your learners as well, because without that that um, rapport, you're right. There's no way that you can actually present programming to that learner, and especially if they don't want to play with you or engage in any act like preferred activity with you. So no, I think that's a great critical skill that you must have in order to benefit from the training as well. And then from a personal standpoint, I'm five foot two. I'm a little <laughs> shrimp. I'm a little shrimp. And I have to say this type of analysis, I, I am not afraid for my life. You know, yeah. I am not afraid for my life. I'm in this person's home. At one point he took my hand and he led me to his bedroom. Mm -hmm. Let's go see what's there. Let's go buddy. You know, I mean, um, at the end, and I don't know this kid except for that first day, um, he offered me M&Ms before I left. And the mom is like, oh, wow, he never offers you M&Ms. <laughs> see, he offers <laughs> you a yellow one because he doesn't do that. And sure enough, you know, sure, sure enough, and I asked him, not expecting him to give me any, you know, can I have a yellow one? He gave me one. Um, I mean, how th that was so touching, you know? And so I think that from a practitioner standpoint, and a lot of my school consultations, whom in the past, for whatever reasons, they did not feel comfortable with the standard FA. Um, and a lot of it was unfounded, but it was just a misunderstanding. But guess what? They're like, oh, you want to do the PFA? Sure, go, let's do it. It was just a, maybe a different name. Maybe they, I showed them some videos about what the PFA is about. Um, let's put it this way. For a lot of the school console who said no to me on an FA, said yes to me on the PFA for whatever yeah. reasons. So I was able to, um, you know, be, you know, I was able to get in the door and get into experimental analysis done um, and match, you know, have a better success at matching um, the, the contingency to teach the skills-based treatment. Yeah, I'm a special education teacher right now and there's no way I would want to do a traditional FA in the school system. But a PFA, sure, definitely. Right. I really like how you talked about the, um, Joe just said this too, but I would like to second that, <laughs> that <laughs> you're looking at, you know, the importance of being able to build that rapport and that relationship. Um, we'll talk about this towards the end of the episode, but I think that is really important to recognize. I think sometimes people might see that something's effective in the research, like PFA or any other thing out there that we could find in a journal article, but not consider those prerequisite skills or, you know, what actually goes into making it successful. So I'm really happy that you shared that with us, Celia, and that um, you recognize that. When I first started doing trainings in the schools back in like 2011 or so, I was brought in to help train them on developing instructional control or what we're calling instructional motivation now to make it more clear <laughs> um, that it's a relationship that you're building with the students. And I only had 40 hours with the teacher, but I was supposed to train them on that. And I was like, oh, 40 hours to do, that shouldn't be too bad. But I couldn't get the teacher to understand motivation. And without that, like not, nothing else could happen. <laughs> um, so, you know, she, she would give the, the students, you know, stickers or bubbles or whatever. And I would ask her, why, why'd you do that? Well, because kids like stickers and bubbles. I'm like, was the child showing any interest in those things at that time? No. <laughs> so we basically <laughs> spent the whole entire 40 hours with me teaching her how to connect with her students and really just gauge their motivation. I didn't even get to go beyond that, but her developing that skill in and of itself is obviously huge for, you know, additional work that she would do with her students. But I think um, it's helpful to know what some of those sort of prerequisite skills are really essential critical features of a protocol are 
to uh, make it effective. Yep. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we both watched presentations at ABAI relating to uh, PFA and SBT. And there weren't a ton of them, but I thought it would be helpful to sort of share thoughts around those presentations. As you know, I can talk for hours, Celia, so I'm not going to do that. I'm limiting myself to three thoughts, and then if you want to share three or more, that's fine. But if, if I didn't limit myself, I'd say so many more things. So um, I'll go first and just get mine over with quickly and then see what your thoughts were. One of the things that I it's sort of related to this, but not, um, not exactly. One of the things I noticed was, in general, there were more presentations this year relating to not using extinction. So one of the nice things about the ABAI virtual convention, you could type anything into the schedule to see what came up, whereas I've never been able to do that on the app or in the book, just like put a keyword in and find all the talks around that keyword. So I just typed in extinction and there were about like 10 or so presentations where it, extinction came up, but all of them were looking at how can you do whatever procedure without using extinction. So that was really exciting to see, especially having presented on that topic for the last 10 years. And this was the first time I think it was more than just myself that came up. Actually, I wasn't even one of them this year because I didn't talk about that this year. But um, so that was exciting. And then one of the things I noticed, though, with I think you're going to talk about this, too, for me, there seems to still be like a disconnect for people that want to compare the traditional functional analysis with ISCA and the practical functional assessment. I, I've talked about this in the challenging behavior webinar I did and on a podcast episode that Joe and I did. So I'll link those in the show notes. But uh, I'm not going to go into detail for this because I would just be here for hours. But there just seems to be people trying to implement the practical functional assessment and use ISCA uh, to analyze things and but like they're not developing it properly and I don't have enough I mean I'm not part of Hanley's lab or anything so I don't know that I'm necessarily expert enough to like really pull that out or not but when I see the presentations I just get really confused or read the journal articles there's so much information missing about how they set up the synthesized analysis that I'm always walking away feeling like, did they really understand what was happening? <laughs> so I know you're going to talk about that a little bit too, uh, in much better uh, words than I just used. But um, I was also bummed to see there were a few talks where they claimed that they tried using differential reinforcement of alternative behavior, and they were like setting themselves up to use something similar to the skills-based treatment. And then that it wasn't successful for whatever reason. Now, I do want to make sure people understand they were not, this was not Hanley's lab presenting. It was other people um, who I think were trying to replicate some of Hanley's work. And they would say, well, we tried DRA without extinction. But as you can see in our graph here, uh, we were not successful. So we had to apply extinction. And there was not really any discussion around any troubleshooting that they did to figure out why the DRA wasn't successful. Um, any attempts at using shaping, like you talked about already, Celia, the importance of shaping and being able to recognize when to reinforce and really build those chains. There was no discussion around that. And looking at the target behaviors that were being taught for the DRA, it's definitely like possible. They could have used all sorts of different shaping <laughs> um, goals for that. And then of course there was no discussion about that qualitative experience for the learner. So you mentioned this earlier, Celia, but the televisability um, still doesn't seem so like people are starting to dip into like, maybe we don't need to use extinction, but then that rigidus, rigid, rigidity comes in for ourselves, I think. And they flip quickly back over to, nope, we, we still need extinction. So I'm hoping to see that continue to progress a lot. I don't, I don't really know. I, I, I'm almost nervous that it's like ingenuine, is that a word? Disingenuous, I think is what I want to say. Attempts to do some of these things only to prove that they don't work, as opposed to really being committed to doing it and doing it properly and being surprised by how effective it actually is. 
So those were my three big takeaways. None of it um, for this part really around the actual PSA or SBT process. It was more observations I made of other talks that seemed similar. What about you, Celia? Um, well, I, I didn't think like this year they had a lot of, um, they, didn't, they didn't have as many symposiums on the PFA and SBT as previous years, of course. Um, the topic is not as hot, you know, um, but I did see two symposiums. So I'll, I'll talk about the one that um, you've just mentioned. Um, there was a, the presentation on comparing the standard FA with synthesized contingency. And I, I think that with any, the problem with any of these symposiums is that they try to fit so many presenters in this one hour or 50 minutes that it is, for me, it is so difficult to just kind of follow their story. Um, and I am not as fluent as you, Megan, uh, where you know they present the slide uh, with lots of data and lots of data points, and they take it away after like 10 seconds. I'm like, wait, wait, I'm not done yet, you know. So, um, you know, what I end up with was just a whole lot of questions, you know. After that, so you know, when I look at the app, I see that they um, identify or isolated the um, the target behaviors, aggression and SIB. So my question is. What did they do? Did they only reinforce those topographic behaviors in the synthesized condition? Because if they did, well, then that is one departure, right, um, of the PFA. What does that mean? Is that departure um, critical? Is, is that significant, right? That's the question I have, because you're not comparing the same things anymore. You're, you're just taking one component of a process and taking it out and then making a comparison to another process that is completely different. What are we comparing, apples and oranges? I mean, what, what benefits are, is that? An apple is different than an orange, we know that. <laughs> but, maybe the question, but maybe the question is like, you know, what kind of variables or profiles from the learner or contacts would an apple be more effective versus an orange? Maybe that's the question, right? You know? Yep. Um, yeah, so I just, you know, I just had all questions like that. Um, also questions about, you know, in the line with what you, you, you have as well, your, your questions, Megan, like what does the synthesized contingency look like? So it was more about a lot of questions I have and it may be because the details were not, you know, maybe the presenter could not present these details because they have 15 minutes <laughs> yeah. um, to present all this stuff. Um, so that was my, my, my take on that one. And then the other symposium I saw um, was actually one presented by Rachel Mitris, um, who presented um, one of the learner, which had some trouble with the implementation of PFA and SBT by the telehealth model. There were some treatment integrity issues towards the end, towards like later in the cap chain. Um, where the team decided, you know what, instead of rehashing everything out and doing a whole bunch of training for the caregivers who didn't have the time and resources to do so, they said, let's incorporate the enhanced choice model. Did you, did you see that one, Megan? Yep. Um, so that really was one that sparked my interest um, because of all the difficulties that a lot of my home case um, clients are also experiencing. You know, kid is cooped up in the room, parents are getting really tired. Um, there's no school. So I'm very interested in, in how we can incorporate that just to keep a lit on everything, just to give the parents a breather, you know? So it works really well for this particular owner. And I think you can maybe speak a little bit more about that. But interestingly, I, I just met with um, D2 Roger Rahman yep. about the enhanced choice model that he presented actually last year at ABBA. Um, and he, you know, his participants were language able uh, learners. And you had mentioned, Megan, that the learner that Rachel Mitris implemented the enhanced choice model for was also a very language able learner. So do you want to talk about that particular variable? Yes. Well, similar to what you kind of brought up, like they only have so much time to present the information. I'm looking forward to Rachel's research being published. So maybe we can get a little bit more detail and any of the other people that presented as well, obviously, sometimes the articles don't help either because of the word limits they have on the articles yeah. too. But um, in the table that she shared, there were three 
participants and it looks like she didn't go into too much detail about their skill sets but just from looking at that summary table it said the one participant was verbal and then the other two were low verbal um, she didn't really explain what that meant and like what the differences were because that wasn't the point of the presentation and the time that she had allotted so I did, that was, is a question to me so far, uh, the, the learners who seem to be showing a really good benefit from the enhanced choice model definitely have that <laughs> verbal piece going on. So I, I hope to see more research on that in the future comparing. I, for my own work with the seven steps, we, we haven't uh, done exactly the enhanced choice model, but it's pretty similar. And I haven't seen much of a difference between learners who are um, highly, you know, on like the vocal verbal versus not. Uh, but it can be harder sometimes to sort of uh, explain, I guess, what you're doing. So um, Rachel talked about that, you know, before they implemented the enhanced choice model, they sort of explained like, here's the options and like, this is what happens in these places and whatnot. So having those like statements or just being able to kind of navigate things a little bit differently, obviously with different skill sets being present, you might see different performances, so. Yeah. Um... Did you see any other presenters in that I, same symposium by any chance? Yeah, I saw what she, I saw for the one that Rachel did, uh, there was the person that presented on and using the enhanced choice model in the schools. And I think that's really helpful. It seemed like most of the questions in that symposium surrounded how to do it in the schools, but I'm really excited that Hanley's group and others are helping to disseminate information that that like this is a thing that could be done in schools because again going back to the seven steps whenever we've done training on that like a lot of the school staff are always like oh there's no way we could implement you know something like this in a school environment where there's more choice involved and it's not so like rigid and regimented um, so I think it's good for schools to see that using more flexible responsive to learner approaches uh, are effective and ultimately, even though you might like have the option for them to escape and like do what they want to do, you get more accomplished when you allow that. <laughs> and I think, Joe, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but I've, I've heard a few families, not of clients, but just family members talk about for this whole like with COVID, how people have been home. Um, you know, it only takes their children like an hour or two to get through the stuff that like they would be covering in the school day. These are kids that are yeah. like high performers. Um, but then they have the whole rest of the day to do whatever they want. And they're super motivated to just like get the stuff done and then have the whole day to do whatever <laughs> they want. Um, so I think that also goes to show like the benefit of that. I mean, we all do that in our work days by the time we're adults too. Sometimes it's detrimental because people don't prioritize and schedule themselves properly. So they end up just doing whatever they want and not getting their work done. <laughs> but, um, but I'm curious about that too, you know, allowing that freedom. Yeah, I'm curious too, because like right now during COVID around here, it's not from the parents that I talked to and a uh, why I have witness and seen online, a lot of parents are very frustrated because they are providing a lot more work than just 60 minutes of work for a week. Um, a lot of our teachers are very gung-ho and um, they want to provide a, like an education to our, our learners. So they're actually, I hear the flip side where the students are struggling to get done with everything that's given to them um, and trying to complete you know what should be 60 minutes of work for the week instead of instead of you know three hours of work each day yeah um so but i think that's also based depending on school district and um resources being provided right now um but yeah i would love more information about um just how that would affect the motivation part with the other school districts well the students can get done in 60 minutes with all their work and have the rest of the day to be free. Yeah, 
And of course, like you'll have idiosyncratic results, I think. Um, the presentation that Rachel did just showed the one learner. I didn't, I, I'm going to be honest for the first one about the schools. I didn't attend and take as many notes as I did for Rachel's because <laughs> I don't work in the schools right now. But, um, but I think, you know, this particular learner in that study chose the, uh, the contingency and the practice sessions most of the time. And that was mm -hmm. his preference. But I think that's something else to, you know, different people might have different preferences as well. I, I think some of the work that Dr. DeLeon's done with breaking points and looking at in behavioral economics, um, they found that some learners, no matter what, no matter what their uh, various reinforcers are that they're being offered, they, when they were allowed to have like a choice in what they were, what their reinforcement schedules were, they, they had higher breaking points, meaning they would work longer and harder if break, just having a break <laughs> was yeah. available versus not. Um, so that's, you know, for some, some people, like I'm kind of one of the people who just like, I want to sit down and like get my stuff done and then like get just, if, even if it takes like five hours, I'd rather like get it done. And like the completion of the task is super reinforcing. Whereas other people, they, you know, tend to work, seem to work faster if they like, they sit down for 30 minutes and work th that full 30 minutes and they take like a 10 minute break and then come back. I don't like that, like back and forth piece. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be interesting to study further as well. I didn't have that in our notes originally, but I just thought of it just now, like looking at, there's probably going to be preferences that play out where people, you know, want to stay in the practice condition and just like get it over with. It's <laughs> 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 so like they kind of bounce back and forth between the different. So we probably should say what, um, I think you might've mentioned this. I can't remember Celia. Did we say what the three choices are in the enhanced choice model? Yeah, um, okay. so you have the practice, right? You have the practice condition. So you would um, practice the SBT uh, process. You have the hangout where the reinforcement and contingencies in the hangout condition is matched to the best that is possible with the practice. And then- But you there's have just no, nothing, no demands presented. It's just- No demands, no demands. You still have your attention and you know all the contingencies of reinforcement contingencies are matched. Um, just like the practice, but no work, no demand in the hangout. And then you have the exit. Um, and so with, um, that's easy to do, right? If you're at the clinic, you just say, mom, I gotta go. I wanna leave. You just leave. But at the home, you would be basically say, I don't want to choose hangout or practice. So that would be exit. And uh, it's just so counterintuitive. Like I, if, I, if I give that to my kids, like most of us would be like, oh my God, they're gonna choose hangout, of course, right? I mean. A lot of us would think that, but it was pretty, um, but that's not what the outcome is showing. But I'm also wondering, like, if I do this at my home-based clients, just to check it out for like 60-minute session, see what happens. I think it also will help us um, get a lot of information about the learning arrangements, about the therapist, right? So if you have a kid that say, I don't want to hang out with you either, and I don't want to work <laughs> with you, I'm just going to exit all the time. I mean, that gives you a lot of information about um the therapist right or the staff yeah. who is or even the stuff you have <laughs> and the yeah. stuff <laughs> yes so there's like so many variables like you know do you keep the stuff that you earn in practice and the stuff that you have freely in the hangout a closed economy when you exit or is it open so yeah. there's just, like you said there's so many questions and there's a need for replication yeah I know when they talked about it in the training in January that I went to, at least in the schools, it was like, and in the presentation at ABAI, if the person chose to, to exit or to not be there, they just went back to like whatever was happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that would be more of a closed economy because this, the items that would have been in the practice or the hangout weren't available. So I think that brings up an interesting, because like when you're in the house, like the things are still there. <laughs> So <laughs> it's not like you're, you're leaving. So do those things go with them or do they just stay in that area? That oh, they... you know what you could do as, as a uh, staff, you know, as a therapist or a practitioner, you bring the stuff in. So, you know, it's kind of like it, typical therapy environment, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially in ER, you come into the home, you bring your stuff in, you bring your stuff that are prefer, of course, prefer for the student, prefer for that learner. And then when you leave, when session's over, you take them with you. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. 
Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let you know when yeah. I this, okay? Yeah, I mean, like, it's interesting because, like, I'm just thinking about the school environment is because, um, yeah, the, school, the therapist could bring all this really fun reinforcing stuff, but there could be other things that are more reinforcing in the classroom. And I'm, yep. and I'm just wondering about that. I mean, because I know some of my students there, they thrive off of, um, and they want more social interactions with their peers rather than, you know, being able to play on an Xbox by themselves or it, it, it it's just interesting. And you're right. It needs to be replicated and um, more research needs to be done. For sure. Yeah. For the other talk that you mentioned, Celia, um, where they were comparing the PFA, well, ISCA to traditional FA, um, I kind of already mentioned it in my like top three or whatever, but I just felt like there just was not enough information <laughs> presented at all in that presentation. I would have liked so much more, even if it was just like written on a slide for me to take a screenshot of and look at later. So I really do hope that that gets published because, but I feel like even in the publications that have come out, like Fisher had one Fisher and colleagues and Greer and colleagues. And I think there's a new one that I haven't had a chance to read yet because it came out during COVID. Um, I think That's you funny. and I even talked about trying to talk about that one sometime too. Yeah. Um, that's the next podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but there's never enough detail. Like they just say like we we synthesize the contingencies and it's like, okay, but <laughs> what did that look like? <laughs> like what did you do? Um, and I especially get confused when the presentations or the articles seem to have the same it's almost like they think that just um, being present and uh, reinforcing everything is the is the full deal. And I like how you pointed out, you know, with the the way that the topographies were split out, and there wasn't really any discussion about the. Um, I think it's referred to as like response one and response two in the work that Hanley does and the trainings that they do, where it's like you have your your bigger challenging behavior that's really the behavior of interest to try to decrease, but then there's all these precursors and that's where you're doing, you know, reinforcing at that level. You don't wait for the big stuff to happen. Um, and without even mentioning that, it's like, how did you have a real true understanding of your person? <laughs> right. Right. I, I just don't think it's a good, it's a, it, it's a fair comparison when you take one component of, um, a process and just take it out or, you know, when you are not replicating the entire process, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's hard. And certainly, like I said, I came out with so many other questions on the detail piece of the implementation that I almost feel like, you know what, no comparison is going to be truly valid unless you have someone who is a PFA implementer and your standard isolated contingency FA implemented working together. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, we could technically argue that Hanley is that person because he came oh, yeah. <laughs> from that background and yes. progressed to what he's doing now, but not, that's not acceptable for everyone. So, um, you know, I, I have to tell you, like, you know, I am just really learning how to do research, you know, in my doctoral study and I, I haven't been out in the field for that long. Um, but I, I can just tell you what works to bring positive outcomes for my families and learners and what have kept staff safe. Um, and, and I'm also speaking from a mother with a child on autism, you know, what yeah. is, you know, the, 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 pr the preference and the social validity from all the stakeholders. So I can speak from that aspect. Um, and I have to tell you the, for the past three years, that's all that's all I've done, the experimental analysis of contingencies. I have been using the PFA. Yeah. Well, I think that that, um, you know, we, I don't want this to turn into a whole episode no. about that because I've worked, we've done that. <laughs> I get really heated. But I, one last thing that I'll mention though, is I do, it, does, it kind of saddens me that the people who may want to stay in the traditional camp for whatever reason, aren't at least looking at where our field is going in terms of treating people humanely and, and really limiting the amount of problem behavior, um, challenging behavior, interfering behavior, whatever tact you want to use there. But 
you know, there's at least lessons that Hanley has learned and is being very vocal and presenting on regarding how to create the most safe and humane experience for the people that we serve. So at the very least, if you're consider, if you still do traditional FA and that's just like where you're going to stay and you don't maybe have the resources to learn a whole new process or something like that, at least adopt the adjustments there, right? Reinforce at the precursor, um, have an open door policy, look at the research on assent and withdrawal and, and take into account at least those things, like how do you keep people safe? Because I don't think it, regardless of you know what people wanna say about, well, you have to isolate the contingency. If you don't, you may have like other effects or false positives and negatives and all that kind of stuff. If you're that set that you have to isolate the contingency, at least put into place the safety measures that Hanley's been presenting on and, and has adopted over the past few years. And I'm not, I'm sure it's not just Hanley, right? I'm sure there's other people presenting on that. Um, Upswing Advocates has some amazing literature and uh, webinars and trainings that they do on the topic of assent and withdrawal and, and those types of humane interactions with our clients. But I think that that's at least one big take home people could take, whether they want to do traditional or, or something new. Agree, yeah. disagree? <laughs> yeah, agree, agree. You, we need to learn the battery of assessments and um, just make choices that are individualized, right? For, you know, for the learner, the stakeholders, the resource, the skills of the staff, contacts, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I do. Apples and oranges. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can have both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I probably won't. <laughs> I probably yummy, won't yummy. have both. I think I just like apples. Which one did we say was PFA? All right. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Joe, you're up next to ask a question. I'll stop talking. No, you're fine. You're fine. So, um, Celia, you all have been using PFA and SBT for quite some time. Can you share with us any lessons you have learned? Yeah. Um, just reflecting upon, upon, you know, upon the cases um, that have gone quicker and some that have gone smoother. Um, I would say to summarize, there's been two variables that are influential um, in regards to whether, uh, you know, whether progress is being made faster or slower. And these two variables are the dosage of practice, meaning that, you know what? The staff is doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're shaping nicely. The learner is doing awesome. The caregivers are doing awesome, but we're not progressing as quickly. And that's just because there's just not enough practice. Just increase the dosage. That makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So instead of practicing, you know, two hours, two times a week, can we do it three to four times a week, even if we have to listen to one hour of practice? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That consolidated practice, you know what I mean? Instead of practicing it once a week, but for longer weeks, right? So more consolidated, more compact. I guess that's a better word, more compact. So increasing the dosage that way. And then the next thing is that I have find it difficult, especially with insurance um, funded cases, is that there is a struggle to have the BCBA on site more for supervision so that we can have more within session shaping. Meaning that, hey, um, guess what? We put in this STO, there's no problem behaviors, but there's no FCR, there's none of these. What do we do? Well, you gotta up the EO. Don't wait until that BCBA comes in, right? Yeah. Um, or conversely, oh my goodness, problem behaviors are happening, precursors are happening. What do you do? Well, then we need to examine that target and lessen that EO we're going too fast. So that shaping piece, we need to do more of within session. Um, and when that happens, that is one variable that can make the difference between a learner's performance progressing faster or slower. Does that make sense? That does, that does. So what are your thoughts, Megan? I think that's great. I think it's helpful for people to hear about the different things that need to be done from a troubleshooting standpoint have you all uh do you have any sort of resources you've made to like help monitor um whether you know things like any troubleshooting needs to be done or even at the yeah. you know how over time like you get every learner is different but you start to maybe see kind of profiles break out where it's like oh with 
well, we had a situation where the, a learner was similar to this. So for this one, we may need to start this way instead. Yeah. And, and, and I hate to put like a, um, a rigid guideline, but you know, something to go, go by would be like, you know, if you have three data points, three consecutive data points where um, the learner is emitting the appropriate behavior, you can move up to the next STO. Okay. And all at the same time, if you have problem behavior or precursor behavior, that's I me mean, three times in a row, please text me, you know, there's a problem there. Don't work on that STO go back and practice the previous STO. Let's just keep it there mm -hmm. until I get there. Um, so we don't have to learn to practice problem behaviors, right? Yep. Because um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's so hard. Once they practice it, they become fluent at it. I'm like, ah, oh, and it competes with the new response that I want them to emit. Does that make sense? Um, so those kind of, um, and, and I have, you know, we have requested insurance to, um, you know, for more supervision hours because learners are on this particular uh, program and they are early on this program. In other words, they're not like far end in the, you know, in the, uh, the end of the caption, they're like towards in the beginning. So it's really important that um, we do more within session shaping and that we are overseeing what the staff is doing. So for a lot of the insurance um, providers, they have agreed to um, increase um, supervision hours for BCBA on those cases. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Yeah. And I love that you have that decision point in there at least to, so that <laughs> a, a learner's not stuck at a stage for too long either. Like you could have the opposite where there's great data on an STO, but the um, implementer doesn't move on. <laughs> they just stay, <laughs> stay in yeah. one spot and reinforce that, you know, responding for too long. Um, yeah. So that's good to have both when to move on and when to take a step back or contact you. Yeah definitely a, um, you know, just have being available for the staff, um, especially in the beginning of the process. Um, it's, it's really critical, you know, just be flexible that, you know, let you, you know, your staff will be able to text you and you can contact them or just, you know, being supportive and just being available a little bit more. Yeah. Really help. Yeah. I, um, it's funny because I present on this, but one of the lessons that I've learned and I haven't, you know, ex um, extensively implemented like you, Celia, I'm mostly a, a fan and a co and like a cheerleader for the process because I don't have too many clients right now, I guess a disseminator to like help people learn more about it. But uh, one of the lessons that I learned was really that importance of, of really, really being responsive to the learner and what they're showing you. So that's something I've focused on again for over 10 years, but we, with the one case that I uh, have, the mo have done the most on with this, we were missing key indicators of, uh, of the precursor type behavior. So we didn't even realize it. Like there were some obvious ones like screaming or making certain faces and things like that. But there were other ones where like, maybe saying something and, and calmly saying it, but while calmly saying it, reaching the arm out to like sort of control the person. <laughs> like I will make you give me whatever I'm asking for um, was uh, obviously an indicator that they weren't happy, relaxed and engaged. So really like getting better tuned in on how, how the learner's doing in terms of staying happy, relaxed and engaged. And, and I, I'm really grateful for the, work and training I've had up until this point on uh, systematic desensitization and response, uh, wow, exposure and response prevention, ERP, um, in terms of what I learned early on in my career, even as an undergrad, but there was always this idea that there needed to be like, or not there needed to be, but that some little level of discomfort was okay as long as you were like at that balanced threshold and like didn't push too far, but you couldn't move to the next step if that little bit of discomfort was there. And I've really seen with the work that Hanley's been doing that um, there's just such a fine tune, tuning in to the learner and really looking at was that happy, relaxed and engaged or does even your slight body movement this way that looks totally calm and like really doesn't look uncomfortable at all is a signal that you're not happy, relaxed and engaged and we're moving too quickly, right? So like really being able to key in on, on those 
things that may not even seem to be discomfort for the learner, but they're clearly showing they are not happy or relaxed. And, <laughs> yeah. and you brought up a good point that, you know, reminded me that one of the key variable that has really changed the way we do things is that instead of a time-based performance, so another time-based uh, protocol to a performance base, meaning that, okay, you can go take your five minute break and five minutes up on your clock, we go back to work. Now we're going to look at the learner's performance. And that has really um, mitigated the aggregation of EOs building up by the end of the session. Oh my God, the learner has had it. You know, So mm. we're avoiding situations like that because we're not letting the EOs aggregate. We're going to go back to work when the learner is ready. Does that make sense? So yeah, that is like a huge improvement. Um, and the other thing is, you know, in the beginning, you know, I, I find that we have to sort of like teach the staff who might not have any exposure to this is that, you know what, this trumps all the other skill acquisition program. So it's not like right now we work on PFA and then the next time, you know, we're going to work on, man we're going to work on um, matching to sample. No, 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 no. This trumps everything. You know, and so even explaining it to caregivers, it's, it's not like this is a program. We'll work on a few trials of this program. Then we go into the academics. It's not that. This trumps mm -hmm. everything. There's a reason why we're doing this. It's because we have problem behaviors and the learner engaging in problem behaviors mean the learner is not a ready learner. You can't teach mm -hmm. anything until yep. you, right? Does that make sense? Of course it makes sense. Yeah. You taught me this, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you if it makes sense. That's silly. Yes. No, it definitely makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's see, what's our next thing that we were going to talk about? Joe, did you have any additional thoughts to add to that before we move on to the, I think we're almost closing out here. Yeah, we're close to closing out, but no, I mean, it's just hearing you sp speak about the different EOs and um, how you work with clients is amazing. Um, and something that I'm definitely going to have to consider too, like whenever, uh, with my own clients, um, and really dive into how to program, um, session now. Yeah, so. it's true. It's like teaching that therapist, the therapist will call me text and say, and you know what? I didn't get that many data points in, um, of, you know, his academic work because we had to spend more time getting him back into HRE. I'm like, good job, that's okay. Yeah. You know, so it's also reframing their mindset. Like just because the, the learner is cooperating with you to do an academic piece of work or to do any work, doesn't mean that, you know, it, is that learner cooperating with you under aversive control or is that mm -hmm. learner cooperating with you under reinforcing properties that you are providing? That's, yeah. that's so critical, right? To be able to ask that question, huh? You know? <laughs> yeah, which is like really powerful. Like, especially in my cl like classroom now is like, I make sure like my students are ready to come back. Um, once they, I mean, when they're ready to work, that's when we're ready to work. Um, if they don't complete a whole bunch of work, that's fine because they're not ready to work with me. Right. Um, so, but no, uh, so I think the next question, Megan, yep. is uh, this is the part of the podcast that you really wanted to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if I can uh, <laughs> refrain from going on too many uh, slope boxes here. So, um, so what part of what spurred this podcast episode was my ongoing desire to see things constantly improving. So I'll share some thoughts I have on this, but um, first I wanted to check in with you, Celia. Uh, what you might think of as like next steps for PFA SBT research or that you think might be helpful for practitioners relating to PFA and SBT? Um, yeah, I think um, you mentioned this earlier on. Um, I think going forward, it would be great to look at the replication, uh, do more replication on how we can incorporate the enhanced choice model um, into the PFA process. Um, the other thing that um, I would like practitioners to learn more about is to understand the philosophical underpinnings and the framework and this whole molar perspective of behaviorism um, to guide their practice. I think that when, when practitioners have more of, a, of that understanding, they will be more flexible to become less rigid. They will be more flexible. They would 
you know, they will implement the process in a more progressive, in a more progressive manner. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> so much shorter than what I'm going to say. <laughs> 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 Not surprisingly. No, and I definitely agree with you on all of that, especially the part about the learning the underpinnings and that, you know, even some of like relating to the historical perspective, but really having a good grasp on, especially shaping, because not a lot of people do. Um, I know that's not as molar as you were talking about, but like just that in and of itself is something that's not really targeted well enough in our training programs right now. So, um, so for me, a couple of the points that I thought of, one is identification of prerequisite skills for being successful with the PFA and SBT. And I think Celia, we already talked about this regarding the, from an implementer side of things, I hadn't even thought about it from that angle, but obviously, you know, what are the critical features there and making sure that implementation goes well. But I was thinking more along the lines of for the clients and the learners. So I, um, uh, one of the things that I've presented on for the last few years is regarding emotional regulation, which I know is sometimes taboo in our field, but it's real. <laughs> so I think, and it's, you know, it's a big topic of conversation, especially in the schools, and it probably will continue to be even bigger after COVID and mm -hmm. all the different things people have been experiencing relating to that. But so, you know, is it, is it possible just through the shaping process within the skills-based treatment to, you know, break things down far enough and be that tuned into the learner that those emotional regulation skills would develop? Or is it better to spend some time really help, you know, in neutral moments doing some explicit training on, you know, how to express different emotions and transition in and out of those emotions. So like, it's okay to be mad and th these are safe ways to be mad or it's, this is how we can be calm. I just did a program with my son who's four called emotional ABCs. And I actually didn't do it correctly. <laughs> it's a computer based program. So I just logged in and like went through the lessons with him, found out after we finished it that they had a whole teacher section with a scope and sequence and mm -hmm. all of these like lesson plans and like activities in addition to the, the computer online portion of it. But just doing the online portion of it really laid out for me how many different like skill sets are involved in like, not just recognizing emotions, but you know, learning to talk about what your body is feeling and that like physiological sensations that you go through when you're experiencing different emotions. They have a, a really cool, um, they use a lot of behavioral skills training, but they have this like little diagram or I don't know, picture thing but basically their process is that they initially lay the, the groundwork by explaining the different emotions and the different sensations and all of that kind of stuff. But then the final like sort of take home with it is you te they teach like a three-step process to the kids of like, what, how do you regulate this? So when you're feeling something, you pause and you take some breaths and then you rewind and you think about why am I feeling this way? And then you make a choice and you press the play button and choose from their playbook. And they have this playbook of like, I don't know, six to 10 different things you can do. So my favorite one is the reframe <laughs> where you just like reframe what's happening to you and like make a, a more positive choice or whatever. Um, but so that there's like a lot involved in those processes. And that was just for my son who's typically developing. Um, so I've done a lot with learners who don't have high language uh, where we just practice different exercises around like just showing calm and showing mad. And I have done some trainings on that. So I wonder, like, I've only ever done a PFA SBT process with learners who I've also already worked on coping and some tolerance skills first. Uh, so in the, the videos that I've seen, a lot of the videos I've seen in the trainings or from other people that have done it, their learners are also ones that have some level, like they, they might engage in a really high level of challenging behavior, but they also, um, they also seem to have some level of emotional regulation. So I'm curious about like what role that in particular would play. Like, is it, if, as long as you can break things down far enough, it's, it kind of develops as part of the skills-based treatment, or is it something that you would need to sort of practice on its own? Um, 
I think that that'll be an interesting area to look into. Before I talk about the second one, Celia or Joe, do you have any thoughts about that particular piece? Well, I, I think that that's that skill set is so uh, lacking in so many of our learners, you know? Um, and I, I think that it's hard to engage in that more appropriate response on the times of stress or contacts of stress. So we do need to create um, a condition for them to practice in where the condition is not as aversive, you know? And, and just through exposing that less aversive condition to them and a lot of practice opportunities. Yeah. Um, and I think like you could argue with skills-based treatment that that's partially happening, but at least in the work that I've seen so far, I'm not seeing kind of like a coaching through of some of the emotional regulation that I would do when that's what we're working on. And I'm not saying you couldn't do them both at the same time, but I just would love to see that brought in a bit more. Jonathan Amy does a lot of really great work with, uh, he's starting to break down, you know, like the component and composite skills relating to emotional regulation and taking it all the way from like the base level of like being able to fluently move your body up to breathing, up to like some yoga, mindfulness type stuff, all the way into like act and metaphors and things like that. So really going from like the base level, if, if you can't even you know, recognize if your heart's beating fast or slow, or if you're like how your breathing is, it's highly unlikely that you're going to do some of the more advanced, like act, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> exercises and things like that, or that in a moment of stress, you'll be able to notice what your body's going through and like make any sort of changes there. So, um, so I love the work that he's doing, but I'd really like to see, you know, is that stuff that, would enhance the effectiveness of the skills-based treatment? Is it something that maybe needs to be done first? Is it something that can be done parallel? So just more, you know, research yeah. around that. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many different, um, different tech, I mean, techniques, there's different programs that you can use and there's so many of them, but um, I, I feel like we're still lacking just with like, what's the best um, course of implementing emotional regulation to for within programs. Um, and I think that it, I would really see more research and see if that's a component that we can just use more with the F, uh, PFA or just um, what, what, I mean, how we can best address that component with our learners too. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts, Megan and Celia? Well, I, I do like the, um, you know, how we're using um, the variable progressive um, schedule to build tolerance. And that's, that's what emotional regulation is. Like we all have aversive situations. We all have conditions where we feel like I need to get out of it, but we don't. And we don't punch mm -hmm. someone. We, <laughs> we do something else, right? Yeah. We do something else. But you know, for me to build that skill, it's building a toleration of it. So I'll give you a, uh, an example. Like my, my son, he used to get really, really upset when he loses um, in a competitive sports, let's just say whatever, basketball, shootout, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, and it's, that's not the time to teach it, especially no. when we play that sport and when he's in that condition or potential of an opportunity to be in that condition of losing once a week, right? This is back in Little League or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. But, you know, we started out as rolling the dice. You know, see who, let's roll the dice. Whoever has the lower number loses. And if you are the loser, you'll get a tally. If you have enough tallies, you'll earn some arbitrary reinforcer, right? So I'm pairing losing with something that it's not as bad, right? I'm yeah. pairing it with, with some arbitrary reinforcer. And guess what? There's a lot of opportunities. I can roll the dice 50 times. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and that's a really one, that was one way for me to introduce that aversiveness, aversiveness of losing, but in small quantity, and I can build lots of opportunities for losing, losing, you earn a tally, losing, you earn a tally. If you win, that's great too. And so just over time is exposing him to these small elements of aversiveness and a lot of dosage of practicing the alternative skill, which is 
next time I'll try again. Or, you know, that was a, that was a good role, mom, whatever that alternative is, you know, instead of mm -hmm. getting really upset. So where was I going with this? So yeah, you, you have just to given us an example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of building that tolerance, you know? Um, I mean, just think about how we, how do we keep it all together? How do you, how do you keep it together? Um, Megan and Joe, like in, in context of like aversive situations, how do you keep it together and not lose it? You know, so think back to all those lesser aversive situations that you had experienced and you had practice of, you know, you had the opportunity to practice the alternative response and yep. that got you to a better outcome. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that example. Yeah. That, that, that was a really good example. I love that. Like I'm just now sitting here just like replaying an example in my head. I'm like, that is really cool. Yeah. Um, so one other piece that I would like to see more done and disseminated regarding PFA and SBT is instances when it isn't working and why we all know about with research and presentations and whatnot, you tend to get to all the like good stuff and like what, what went well. Um, but there's, I, uh, I highly doubt that there's anything that's a hundred percent happening correctly all the time. Um, so or not correctly, but effectively. So I'd like to see more of that, you know, discussed. Um, whether it's practitioner sharing, I know on the Facebook page, people do pop in and like ask troubleshooting questions and whatnot. But I, you know, again, I think that there may be, we may end up seeing that there's certain environments or circumstances or implementers or various things. We all know with um, any sort of programming that we do that there's a lot of variables that go into it. So, you know, what is the ideal situation for implementing PFA and SBT? And, you know, what types of things might we need to be prepared to troubleshoot or uh, teaching we might need to do, training we might need to do ahead of time to make it the most successful. And of course, you know, seeing maybe they won't get published in journals, but seeing some presentations of failures <laughs> and discussions around like why those maybe failed or how it could have been done differently. I do think we get some of that in the, the trainings that FTF does because they'll say like, we used to do it like this and now we do it like this. And it was because of such and such, but that's like a little quick, you know, sentence and then it's over and it's on to the next thing. So, um, I really would like to see, especially for some of the more complex cases, like the example from the, from ABAI, Rachel's enhanced choice model, uh, the person that she talked about was verbal and when she described his, um, you know, the contingencies that were happening at baseline where it was basically like anytime he engaged in challenging behavior, mom just gave him everything he wanted. So that makes it a little bit simpler to address, I believe, and like see amazing graphs like she had than if you have a case where, you know, this maybe the learner has been with some of the best of the best in the field of behavior analysis, the parent is doing everything you know, possible under the sun, uh, and there's still persistence with some challenging behavior, um, that's going to be a lot harder to figure out and like why that learner hasn't made progress. So hearing more about cases that are more complex like that, especially, um, I know Tradewinds is going to be doing a presentation for us for the Do Better movement in June. Uh, which I guess it's June today is what we're recording on June 1st. So that should be really exciting because they're going to show some cases of learners who are in high school or who are adults that have really long learning histories of challenge of engaging in challenging behavior and that aren't verbal and have uh, or vocal verbal and have like various skill sets that have been affected by the level of challenging behavior that they engage in and showing some of the progress they made. So seeing you know, examples like that would be really helpful as well. But one of the other things that ties into this, a lot of the, the research I've noticed, and I've thought about this off and on, I think sometimes in the trainings they talk about it, but I can't honestly remember. But a lot of the times we see the data that's presented is like the practice session data, right? So we see, did they engage in challenging behavior during the practice sessions or not? But what about outside of the practice session? So 
that's something I think is important to know as well. Um, obviously, like Greg does a great job with like social validity and getting those measures. And um, Celia, you talked about how like people are seeing gains that they hadn't ever before. But, um, but if the data that we're mostly seeing is, and this is true, not just with PFA and SPD, but with any intervention that's done, if the data we see is only from that session, <laughs> from the, the intervention time, um, we're, we've been focusing a lot on like multi-level assessment and training people on that. What are, what are the assessments, you know, to show how it's actually happening in the natural environment and that it persists over time and all that kind of stuff too. So I sort of you know, threw two on, together there. <laughs> on some of my school console, um, for some cases where the, the caregivers doesn't take data, so, you know, after sessions with the staff, we give homework, right? We ask the caregiver to do this, just keep on practicing this. And then the next time we, next, next session, they would probe to see if the learner can still do that STO um, before moving on. So it, I, I guess that would be like a, a probe data. Yeah. So yeah. we kind of alleviated the caregivers to take data. Yeah. And that's part of the difficulty is like getting the data in the natural environment. I think we could do, there could be like some sampling or something where it's like at the same time every day, even just a plus or minus, does the challenging behavior happen at five o'clock, you know, or whatever the highest probability time would be. So you wouldn't even need a frequency count, but just something, is it happening or isn't it? Yeah. Kind and of then deal. what happens is that you also find like caregivers say, oh my God, I didn't take data, but he has this big meltdown. And then we ask them to describe what happened. I'm like, you know that that's STO number 25. We're now on five. <laughs> so these, these like accidental eels, you know, they don't mean to put them in, but they do. I'm like, it's really aversive. It's a really difficult situation going from like something reinforcing to asking him to do the most aversive thing. You know, that's why he's engaging in that problem behavior. That makes sense, you know. Yeah. It's nothing that you did wrong. It's not, it's not the learner, but that's just like STO number 25 and we're on five right now. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's another like really helpful point in relation to like the PFA SBT process. A lot of the times when I see people looking at challenging behavior, they're not thinking about it at that level of detail, right? They're just like, we came up with a behavior plan and we've identified the function and now it'll go away. <laughs> And it's like, hey, it's not that simple. Um, so I think, you know, having the team be that tuned in on, well, that's all the way up here and we're just here, but also then helping the families or whoever else is involved with the learner, the, the teachers or the community-based settings and that kind of thing so that they can really understand of like trying to, I know Meryl Winston kind of talks about antecedents, manipulations, not being like the best thing ever, but you get you get a better picture of, and his argument there is that like, if that's all you do and you don't fade them out, <laughs> but you get a better picture of like how to, you're going to kind of walk on eggshells a little bit around certain things and like limit stuff. But then as the skills get more and more built, you can start pushing things more. Um, so it's more systematic as opposed to like, oh, we didn't really, well, he's, you know, there's a behavior plan in place. He should be able to do this now. Right. It's like, no, yeah, <laughs> not how this works. Yeah. Would that be helpful in the school setting, Joe, to have like a, especially to communicate with the, the teachers and the school staff of like, you know, here's the goal, but we're here. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it would, it would. Um, there's a lot of things that would benefit schools, just to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Megan, you went through um, your things that, um, would be helpful to practitioners practitioner celia do you have anything she said yeah. hers oh, yeah. okay yeah. yeah but did you have anything new to add <laughs> after i did mine <laughs> no um no not at all um i just feel like there's a lot of things that as a new practitioner um that we still have yet to dive into do you have anything that um megan or uh, Celia, do you have anything that any or any resources that you would, would uh, suggest for new BCBAs to look into if they want to learn more about PFA or SPT? Do you want to go first, Megan? Um, probably will say the same things. Yeah, I think we'll probably say the same things. You go <laughs> first, and I'll let you know if there's anything I would add. <laughs> yeah, um, few things. Um, 
there are some free videos on YouTube. Um, they're like maybe a total of three hours. It's like an hour and, and change that's done by um, Dr. Hanley. Those are old, but it will give you um, a good introduction to the process. Um, there is a, a website called Practical Functional Assessment, and in there you will find um, recommended articles to read. There are some videos in there. There's like treatment integrity, um, procedure um, type of materials for you. And then you can also go to FTF Behavioral Consulting uh, Group um, and get some content there. And I would for sure go to the literature. Um, and if mm -hmm. anyone would like to kind of get a whole list of this literature, I did a you know lit review on the PFA and I kind of aligned it to the uh, different branches of behaviorism. You can email me, I would be happy to share that paper with you. Um, that gives you, you know, if you look at the reference list, you'll see all the um, literature out there uh, right. that we have, yeah. Perfect, Anything thank you. Can I miss? <laughs> um, no, I think those are both oh, great. Oh, the Facebook group, the yeah. Facebook group. Yes. BCBA is using ISCA. Okay. That's, it's a great That's group. Um, definitely check out, like I mentioned, we will be doing, uh, Tradewinds is going to be presenting for our group for Do Better at the end of June. So definitely check out that webinar. It'll be a great multiple examples of success with the PFA SBT process. And they have a few videos looking at um, the feeding, some of the feeding work that Holly um, did, has done, who's part of FTF as well, Holly Gover. Yes. Um, so I, that would be my addition to that. I mean, there's so much out there now. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like Celia said too, I think looking at some of those like introductory things, but then trying to find someone that can like mentor you a bit of the Facebook group would be a good place to find, to connect with someone. There's quite a few people who were fortunate early on to work with Hanley's group, whether they did research and graduated and left and they're working somewhere else now, or they worked with one of Hanley's students and got coaching and training from them, or they're currently doing it. But there's, there are quite a few people that, um, you know, this process is so effective that they are more than happy to help share what they've learned with others. So. Awesome transitions. Thank you. And then uh, Celia, do you have any closing thoughts? Closing thoughts in general or closing thoughts on the PFA? Um, let's go with closing thoughts on the PFA process. Um, don't beat yourself up if the learner is emitting a behavior that you don't want to see. Don't beat yourself up. Use it as an opportunity to do something better next time around on the next trial. Um, if you're going steady and slow, you're not gonna, you're not going to put yourself in such a bad situation that you can't get out of, you know, um, and ask for help and no one knows at all. And I think Greg Hanley would say that he's still learning from his, you know, from his students, you know, from mm -hmm. his, um, you know, from his staff who are out there with practitioners, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just be comfortable with that. Try it out. And contact awesome. Megan Miller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably more likely to contact Celia when it comes to this, but. <laughs> Well, Megan, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, like Celia basically said, similar to what I would say, I think um, really I've seen a few people who like went to a presentation from Hanley several years ago and they're still doing, implementing things based off of what was presented then. And that's not necessarily wrong, but it is, it's a, um, thankfully an area that keeps improving. It's a, process that keeps improving. So continue to stay on top of their updated resources and methodologies and process and really make sure you're, you know, implementing with as best practice as possible and then stay, stay skeptical and analytical and, and continue to think about what would be best for your learners. And if there's things that could be improved, like 
Celia mentioned as well, they're always improving themselves. So, (laughs) you know, if you have ideas of like what might be, make it more effective, don't think like, oh, but it has to be this way. Um, Each of us have learners with different histories. So you may have something that you need to modify a little bit. That is something I'm hoping in the research we can see at at some point in the future too of like, what are those critical features? Like, sure, shift, be flexible, move things around. That's great, but don't mess with (laughs) whatever. (laughs) So like for me right now, based on like the little bit I've done with it, I would say one of the things not to mess with is the idea of like really shaping and looking at happy, relaxed and engaged and how you're pushing in those EOs and pressing the EOs. Um, because if you mess with that, you base it like, to me, that's like the whole thing that found is like the foundation of this being effective, just my opinion at this moment, but hopefully again, there will be some research. I don't know, Celia, if there's any thoughts you have around that, but, um, but there's bits and pieces like what the FCR is and different things about setting up the environment and whatnot. But like, for me, that's like the one thing you can't mess with. (laughs) Don't do it. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, do some planning, you know, like analyze the steps you would take to increase the EO. You may, you might go off your plan, but it's good to have a plan, you know, outline what you would do to increase the EO outline, you know, the, um, the, the, the approximations to that terminal behavior, that, that, that final cap chain or something, you know, it doesn't mean you can't go off it, but you should have, an idea how you should have an idea about the destination you want to get to. Let's put it that way. You should have the destination, you know? Um, And what was the other thing that we were always told Megan was don't do this alone, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love that. Don't do it alone. Yeah. Love that. Um, So I was wondering, uh, Celia, if anyone had any questions about the PFA or ST, um, STB uh, process, uh, how, how could they uh, contact you? Yes, um, they can contact me at Celia, C-E-L-I-A at A-B-L-G dot org. Okay. And I'll put All that right. in the show notes too, as long as you're okay with that, Celia. Yes, I am okay, more than okay. Love to help out. He has so much free time. <laughs> <laughs> I will helpful. allocate responding to what it's reinforcing for me. <laughs> I think it's funny you mentioned you're getting your doctorate too. I don't even think you said that in your intro of like all your different jobs that you have. Yeah. <laughs> I can't I can't imagine it. I mean, I know I do a, I have a couple of jobs, but I can't imagine getting for my doctor and then have multiple jobs on top of that. But um you're you're um thank you for everything that you're doing by the way thank you for you thank you guys for um helping us and you know always providing so much um content and support we really appreciate it no problem i really appreciate that uh i really appreciate that appreciation all around (laughs) (laughs) um but i i do um celia you've been you know, active in the webinars and different activities that we've done for Do Better since it started. And that's always been very motivating for me. So I appreciate your support and for jumping on the talk with us about PFA and SBT today. Yes. What will you talk about next? What's, what's your plan, you and Joe? Oh, for our time? next podcast episode? Uh-huh. Ooh. Oh, I don't know. We have this like long list on like Google. <laughs> Google Docs that's keep up on that just keeps on expanding yeah <laughs> and it seems like it expands after every single conference or major uh development um so it's never ending and i just like i'll just text joe or he'll text me and i'll be like hey do you have time to record on this day at this time let's hop on which one should we do we usually don't take like you saw with this we scheduled it in a few days it's like we don't ha- unfortunately have a bunch of time to like plan so it's whatever I know there's a lot of great podcasts out there that do a lot of like research on the front end and have a lot of resources and things like that. But (laughs) but ours is more just like, you know, time to chat. (laughs) You know what would be cool? What? If we can use your son and we can do some role playing on pairing via the telehealth model. Good luck. (laughs) (laughs) 
I, I, we could definitely try. Oh, someone's kid. Someone's kid. Yeah. He, man, like, I think we just don't have enough structure because I, I don't, I don't have the bandwidth. So he basically does whatever he wants right now. So like I signed up for a play group, um, a virtual play group. That's amazing. It's really well done with mission cognition and it's like pulling teeth to get him to participate. I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) all right. So he'll be the, like, he'll be the last target, like STO 30. Yeah. (laughs) So she like, he's super easy in person to have fun with, but the same issue when we try to like FaceTime with my parents or my, his, my husband's parents or anyone he'll say he misses people and he wants to see them. And then like, as soon as they're on like a screen, he's like, (laughs) all right, I'm good. I saw them for five seconds. That's all I needed. (laughs) Maybe he's camera shy. (laughs) I don't know. Like he does. He, if he knows I'm recording him, he usually doesn't like that either. So, um, I mean, I obviously don't record him without his permission, but like (laughs) if it's like really (laughs) obvious, if I'm like, do that again for the camera, he's like, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so anyway but, but yeah that's I think that'd be a fun one so anyone who's listening if you have um a child that you want to do some fun examples of telehealth uh feel free to contact us and we can see I I think what I'd love to see is even if um if we didn't have a child per se like I can always just pretend to be a child and, uh, <laughs> and, and like Celia, you, or I know Claire, I feel like Claire would probably have a bunch of fun stuff that she does who's at Acorn in Virginia. Um, If we just got some of the like various people on who are doing telehealth, if they want to just have, ooh, you know, like how they have lip sync battles, we could do a a relationship building battle. (laughs) <laughs> and we could use Taylor and see who could who can develop a relationship with him. <laughs> the longest duration. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm game for that. I'm so challenged now. I love it. All right. Bring it on. <laughs> Let's do it. I'll make a post about it. We'll see what we can come up with. <laughs> make sure he has enough sleep the night before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But yeah, if any of the listeners also have any suggestions, please send them our way. You can either like message us on Facebook or um, on our Do Better page. Just go ahead and drop a drop a comment, and that way we can add it to our list. Perfect. All right. Any other closing thoughts, Celia? Before we go? Um, no, I'm all closed out for now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you, and hopefully everyone enjoyed learning more about PFA and SBT today. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, go forth on your quest to do better, everyone.